It's been 20 plus years and both sides have suffered loss within the culture wars. Talking with those on both sides of the battlefield, cultural diplomacy unites theology and culture in open, peaceful dialogue with the goal of reconstruction instead of destruction. Here are the show's hosts and founders of Ceasefire Strategies, Eric Bumpus and Tim Moranville. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Cultural Diplomacy. I'm your host, Eric Bumpus. And I'm your co-host, Tim Moranville. And this week, we're talking to Craig Detweiler and John Marks uh, about their recent film documentary, uh, Purple State of Mind, and also the book by John Marks, Reasons to Believe. And uh, we've also got uh, Craig's book we're going to be talking about a little bit later, which is the uh, companion guide to Purple State, also by the same title, Purple State of Mind. Uh, we've really got quite a uh, special show for you here today. Craig is a author and speaker and documentary filmmaker and has uh, written the screenplay for Extreme Days and the Disney movie The Duke. John Marks is a uh, former uh, 60 Minutes producer, and he is also the author of uh, Fangland, Reasons to Believe, as well as several other uh, war novels. So we want to welcome uh, both of you to the show today. Uh, how are you gentlemen doing? Fine, thanks. Thanks for yeah, having thank us. Yeah, thank you. Good to be there. Well, thanks for joining us. Why don't we start off by just kind of asking a little bit about uh, what what is a purple state of mind? What does that look like? Well, it's a term I coined really before the last presidential election where Barack Obama was elected president. It's it's I think it's an ability to really listen to both sides, to be conversant in the issues of the day, to understand your opposition, maybe even be able to express their viewpoint. Uh, back in uh, 2004 election, a lot of discussion about red states versus blue states. And I think now the the country's in a fiscal crisis, and so we're all occupying uh, maybe a purple state of mind, where uh, we're feeling a little bruised and battered and doing the best we can. Okay. Well, um, in light of the uh, new presidential election, I know from uh, personal conversations we've talked a little bit about Obama and kind of being more of that purple uh, state of mind. And do you feel that this was mo- something that the country was leaning more towards? Do you feel that our country has a purple state of mind? Or do you feel that this is something we need to work towards? I think we're still pretty divided, frankly. I mean, I think that the, the mistake here would be to say that um, everybody's on board with uh, this, this Obama election that we've all pulled together in this crisis. I think we're numb. Uh, as Craig said, we're beaten up. And so for the moment, we're all kind of laying low and just trying to survive. And so the red and blue thing means less. And maybe red and blue are going to fade out as terms. But this divide between a part of the country that feels, you know, that the last eight years did express some great ideal about the country and during which time, you know, there were things that were really the true America and this other America, this other group of people who thought that the last eight years were an utter and complete nightmare, a kind of prison sentence, and Obama has just let them out of jail. Um, there's some very extreme euphoria on one side and, you know, deserved and exciting. On the other hand, there's really some extreme terror. And all those things are a little bit muted now, but I think they're there. So I think the key, or the one way to start thinking about this is that our pain, our current pain, one of the very few silver linings may be that we can all start to walk in each other's shoes a little bit more and that if we're going to ever going to find a way to look at each other across this divide and say you know we're in this together period you know we may disagree about a lot but we are americans we're in this together this is the time we can't do it now i'm not sure we can and that's not to be um you know alarmist or or fatalist it's just that the the stakes have not been this high probably in our lifetime so we're going to either figure it out or we're not and i think the jury is still out well actually i meant that as both alarmist and fatalist, Craig. I just like to correct you on that. <laughs> well, is this movie ultimately about politics, or is there something deeper to it, and politics is just kind of a smaller subset of the larger issue? What do you think, Craig, John? Craig? Uh, I think it goes deeper. It goes deeper. Politics and culture, and there are lots of different manifestations, but the deeper element is more mysterious, but it has to do with how a people feels at home in the world and with itself as a people. Um, how human beings who really feel very differently about things and believe different things make a home for each other in the world. And, you know, that's not easy. It's not an easy thing to understand. And I wouldn't pretend to, but I think that's that that's closer to the heart of what we're talking about than, you know, than, pol- than just politics. And it's really core values. It's the things that we're willing to fight for, to die for, to shed blood for. You know, it's issues of, of religion, of uh, faith, of doubt, of family. 
I hope that the purple state of mind pushes past politics, which are often really positions rather than core convictions. And, and drills down a little bit deeper to what's really behind our, our grandstanding and our public fights. Well, what led you in putting this film together? Well, I mean, you know, it's funny because when we started out, there was a story we told about, uh, you know, I proposed this book about, uh, about my own life uh, formerly as an evangelical and then my walk away from, or as a Christian, and I, how I walked away from it. And I pitched it to Harper Collins and some other places, and it was bought, and I set about trying, starting to research it, and then I went to Craig really first. The first, was the first person I went to when I sold the book, and I basically said, look, you and I were roommates back when I believed, and I sort of need to start with you know with you and i need to just go back and just talk about all the stuff that we used to talk about and you but from the perspective of our own lives now and um and craig basically i'll let craig take it from here before i sort of muse a little bit on what as i've thought about it over the last year maybe what else might be going on but basically i went to craig and said let's do this talk and he said you know great let's cameras roll but maybe he can talk a little bit about what was going on in his mind when i when i basically showed up with that idea well i think we we both had a little unfinished business you know we we were roommates in college we had a year full of faith uh that morphed into uh differences of you know kind of combined with with john's experience overseas and so we went our separate ways and really had not ever addressed what went on or what didn't happen uh in our own uh journeys of faith and doubt and so purple state of mind was a chance to reawaken those uh kind of sleeping issues and air it out a little bit just as we all kind of get polite with each other this was a chance to kind of say all right we've been polite we've been kind can we actually go a little bit deeper and try to actually treat each other as true friends and kind of reveal a little bit of our soul which makes it sound awful you know i mean i think what i've come to is that some way in some way there was an insufficiency in my own story about myself that i told myself something that was not really true or I had was unexplored or just this whole region. Craig called it unfinished business and that's right, but it was also sort of like it it completely coincided with what was happening in the country. It was sort I could, you know, sit at dinner parties or among colleagues and listen to the growing horror at the rise of the conservative Christian right and um nobody around me knew anything about that part of my life. I didn't talk about it, I didn't advertise with even not even my wife knew much about it. I I look back in retrospect and realize I I forgotten or repressed a lot of it and so even though craig and i had been back in touch and we were friends with friends again you know we hadn't gotten anywhere near that stuff and i sort of thought well you know what i think that you know the blindness that i this blind spot in my life that i see somehow correlates to the blind spot in the country that there's something here none of us are seeing there's something huge and important and vitally american that we are not grasping about ourselves and it's and if we're not going to see it it's going to distort and become weird and it's going to lead to bigger problems. And so I thought, you know, i got to look at this in myself and I've got to look at it in um, in the country. And Craig, you know, in a way, it was a great thing. You know, the thing that I think that I, I've really seen is that I might have, you know, not, not called Craig for this book. I might not have called him at all. I might have just, you know, gone a whole different direction. I have other, I have a lot of family who are Christians. I could have just done it all with strangers. It's, I, you know, it, it, it looks as if in retrospect that it was inevitable that Craig would be a part of the book and that the movie would come into being. But in fact, I look back now, I think, you know what, I could have just as easily not made that call. So it, I think it's fortuitous that I did, because we were both thinking along the same lines, and, and it's, it's a funny thing that we kind of, um, I don't know, that this evolved at all, this movie. I would say, in a sense, it, it was an experiment. You know, we didn't really know what we were going to find, and I think that's what makes it fun. It's a bit of a, it's an unscripted, high-wire uh, drama. We didn't have uh, questions prepared. We didn't really talk about what we would say, what was fair game. You're watching us make it up on screen as we go and uh that's the fun that's the thrill and uh and maybe that's the downfall all at the same time i don't know well that seems to be i mean you'd mentioned in your book that i mean you moved fairly quickly on the production of this film that when you and john had met that you'd gone back to your students if i remember correctly it was like on a monday and you'd basically told your students about the concept of the film what you were going to do and then you'd begin shooting it on wednesday that's right I gave him like 24 hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, I mean, yeah, not only making it up on the spot, but, I mean, you literally just kind of dove head first right into the project uh, with your feet already hitting the pavement running. It was the only way to do it. Mm-hmm. It was the only way to do it because the I think that was the only way to capture the emotional uh, and psychological feeling of the moment. I mean, I suppose, you know, the question is we don't know how we might have done it otherwise, and there may have been a scripted version that would have worked better and been more satisfying to other audiences, but in some ways, I think, that that immediate kind of unprepared confrontation, not, not necessarily in the, in the negative sense, but just literally, we're both there, we haven't, you know, maybe we haven't even formed our thoughts yet on what we want to say. We don't even know what the other guy's going to ask. Um, we're not even sure exactly why we're there. And I think a lot of the particular energy of the movie comes out of that, suddenly opening your eyes and saying, oh, wow, here here it is, and here's this guy, and um, what do I really think about this? And, you know, I think you do see both Craig and I thinking are trying to think what we're going to say you know, before it comes out of our mouth. And the same thing happens, really, uh, in life. You know, you don't you don't get a script. You, you're suddenly at work, and a coworker s- says something, and it triggers all kinds of uh, maybe hidden feelings or old grudges. And you don't know should I, what should I say if I say this? Am I going to create a firestorm? You start to dance around it. How honest should I be about what I really think? And so, Purple State of Mind is designed to help people push past that awkwardness and say, take the risk, put it mm-hmm. out there. You know, risk the relationship for the sake of. Hopefully a larger conversation where we can get on the other side of this kind of uh, valley of our own making. Well, we're here talking with uh, Craig Detweiler and John Marks. We'll be right back to talk more with Craig and John about their new documentary, Purple State of Mind. Welcome to Daily Reflections for Movie Lovers. From Hollywood to the heart, finding nuggets of truth from the movies. Life on the Great Barrier Reef is great, but widowed clownfish Marlin overprotects his only son, Nemo. In frustration, Nemo swims away and is scooped up by a scuba diver to be imprisoned in an aquarium. Finding Nemo, a 2003 movie classic. Through extraordinary circumstances, Nemo flushes out to sea and finally reunites with his grateful father. Nemo knows that a great love and safety are found in the fins of his father. And Marlon knows that true love always hopes, always perseveres, and always protects. Christ left the familiarity and safety of heaven for one reason, too reunion with mankind. Are you tired of swimming away? Then return to God. He's looking for you, ready to embrace you. For more information, go to imamovielover.com. That's imamovielover.com. And we're back talking with John Marks and Craig Detweiler about their film Purple State of Mind. Uh, and we've already sort of touched on the fact that it's more of a spiritual state of mind. Uh, and it also led you guys on sort of a journey, improv journey of discussion uh, between each other. So I want to kind of ask how in the editing process, what was the decision making like to keep as much of the impromptu nature in place without leaving empty space or uh, lackluster responses? Well, the editing was really the hardest part, don't you think, John? Totally, yeah, yeah. Craig, go ahead. Talk about your perspective first. I can get some on mine. Well, just the fact that we actually uh, never sat in the same room together during the editing process, which took almost a year. Uh, We would we would basically cut cut you know a section of the film, maybe 20 minutes of it, and Mm -hmm. send it to each other for comments. And each one of us was like, No, no, no. It looks like you won too much, or No, you have to put that embarrassing moment in there. You can't Mm -hmm. keep that out. It became another conversation. <laughs> yeah, the editing was a was a real conversation carried out through emails and uh, phone phone calls and uh, enraged phone messages left <laughs> on cell phone. Um, I will say that when I started, I got I did I had the first pass and I had I had I did it with a sixty minutes editor in the summer after we shot the reunion footage and the first conversation. And the sixty minutes principle is basically you don't look for the subject matter. You go for your best bite. You know, you pick the stuff that's got pop to it. And that and then you and then you go back and find the stuff that has pop to it that actually also fits, you know, your subject matter. So the first pass we took, we basically picked the stuff that felt alive, no matter what it was. And you know, it was a lot of stuff. I think when we went back and as we massaged 
massaged it. And I mean, it took, gosh, I don't know, two years really from the time we first sat down and started trying to string together, some, you know, do an assembly, even a rough assembly. Um, it started to assume this other life and it began to, the gaps in there began to fill in. And by the time I, the final editor got to it and, you know, we had to throw it to a third, uh, to a third editor who was not with either of us, who then put together everything that we had that then created his own final version of the movie. And we sat with him so for the one and only time that we were in a room with an editor together for a couple of days and basically gave our blessing to the final cut and then all of a sudden you had this thing that was you know had a shape and a form to it with all that lively vivid stuff in it but also with other stuff that he put back in that he thought was relevant to the conversation that neither Craig nor I had really seen you know as being that relevant or interesting so um, in a way you've got you know three separate people here and that doesn't even include the editors who we worked with who were lobbying for their favorite bits who were all trying to say this is the part of the conversation that has to be in um, it, it, it shows that maybe you do need that uh, a mediator who can kind of play the go-between in some of these situations and maybe we need more of that in our own lives you know you get into this kind of drama with your family or your co-workers and there everybody suddenly has a vested interest and starts picking sides and you need someone who can kind of listen objectively and kind of say no that's a good point but you didn't hear this clearly that's actually a good point too and you both need to kind of give a little bit here to find maybe uh, the truth or the humor in the situation well, this question uh, I wanted to direct to you, John, to kind of get your perspective. It seems that in, in talking about a purple state of mind, that when we talk about the country being divided, especially between uh, Christians and non-Christians, what are some of your perceptions on how judgmental do you see the general Christian populace? Do you see that it's an issue of judgment? What should Christians be doing to bring about a better common ground? Well, you know, I mean, I think it, as for it has to be said, it can't be a two-way street. So I think there's a lot to be done on both sides. But from a Christian perspective, I think a huge part of it is just that for years and years and years, the um, the judgment was all that one saw from the outside. And I would say that the judgment and the emotionalism, okay, so there are two, let's just say that for the sake of argument, that the two faces of Christendom that most people saw, and this is Protestant Christendom and, you know, maybe even strictly evangelical, and in a way, let's face it, that is this has been the face of Christendom for the last decade at least, if not longer. Two things. One, television shots of people in church raising their hands and closing their eyes. And two, politicians or preachers on television arguing about the decline of the culture or, you know, or, or political issues. Now, in both cases, if you think about it, there's actually no strictly theological content in either of those, usually. I mean, usually when I saw Jerry Falwell on television, he never went into any depth in, in, in terms of his theology. It was always about the most immediate and visceral piece of that politics, whether it was abortion or gay marriage or whatever you want to talk about. And there was also a lot of talk about the opposition and how awful they were. And when you come to those images of people in church, and I guarantee you, you look at any single episode or show that, about evangelical Christianity, and it almost always leads with shots of people raising their hands in the air and closing their eyes in some mega church. So, curious lack of content in what people outside of the faith actually see of the faith on a regular basis. So, one of the first things I would say is, you know, find some other way to get what actually is real and true and valuable and at the heart of your faith out on the table. Because right now, I think even now, it's so rare to see anything that looks like real life behind that curtain. Um, I think that's huge. Now, whether or not the other side is going to listen or pay attention to it is, is one thing, but, you know, part of this is not leading with evangelism, but leading with vulnerability. Basically saying, you know, I'm not going to, we're going to have to stop trying to preach this to those outsiders a little bit. We're going to have to say, if we want them to see us, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to stop preaching at them. And because that maybe be, would be the third leg of this stool, which is this, is the perception whether or not you see it, you know, but the perception, or say it's on Sunday morning if someone's flipping channels, they see a preacher talking about how great Jesus is, put Pushing the message, pushing the message, pushing the message. So I, I wonder how often it is that people outside the faith ever see any kind of real life, lived life of Christianity beyond the constant pumping of the message or the 
projection of certain things, you know. And I think that's I think most Christians live that way. They don't live in those those three moments. Those don't those don't account for how the daily life of most Christians is lived. So why not find some way to show more of that stuff? So basically, if I understand what you're hoping to see is more of a lived out uh, life. What do what is it like for a day uh, as a Christian? How do they live? How do they go about their daily tasks as opposed to just seeing the church services? Yeah, I'd like to see some failure, some fra- frailty, some fragility, all those things that make people human. I'd like to see some emotion that isn't kind of the big smile and the big bright eyes saying, oh, my life is so awesome. You know, I'd like to see a, one of those pa- pastors who we know from all of our statistics is struggling and failing to, to deal with internet pornography. That guy, however awful he may be to the Christian community, he looks a lot more like a real human being to the rest of the public, which is also dealing with his stuff. You know, mm-hmm. I just think there's been there's way too much of an attempt to present the facade of a perfect life, but partially because of this family values thing and partially because I think there's this perception within the faith that if we're going to be Christian, we have to look a certain way. We have to dress a certain way. We have to be, with, we have to be above reproach. And, um, and also, we have to be always on message and on point. And, you know, in the most mm-hmm. limited sense, that probably works. But in terms of letting people outside of the faith know you're human and you, you're, you, you're weak too and you don't always know the answer and you're struggling and you're, you know, that stuff is critical. So you want to see it in the sense that you want to see the person's humanity. It's not that you want to see more failure in the sense of the way we make it into scandals. No, I don't want to see that. I'm not talking about like Ted Haggard falling from grace. That's all part of the public spectacle. Uh-huh. And I don't know how you do this, frankly, but maybe it comes down to Christians writing better books about themselves or making <laughs> better movies about themselves or, you know, making better, you know, how about a reality TV show in which some schlubby, un, you know, sackless, you know, bleary eyed, you know, Christian with five o'clock shadow just tries to make it through a day. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who would watch that, but I guarantee you that is more akin to the life that's lived out there in the world than anything we ever see on television and, and, and or, or, or any image that it's projected, and there's nobody there trying to sell you a message, and that's part of the problem here is that I think the perception is always that, oh, Christians are always selling something. We all got to believe what they believe. They can't just be themselves. They can't just be human, just like trying to get through the best they know how with their own belief system. I mean, you know, you might underestimate the evangelical power of a message that isn't a hard sell, that is just a projection of a life, someone attempting to live a life. When I was reporting my book, I guarantee you the Christians that made the deepest impression on me were the the ones who didn't bother to try to sell me anything but just were trying to get through because they made sense to me. It wasn't theatrical. It wasn't a performance. And I think most of what people see is a performance that maybe doesn't have that much to do with the heart of lived Christianity. Well, let me flip the question into you, Craig, and ask how you see this, how you would like to react to what John just said, but also I'd like to ask uh, the same question of you, at how you see the non-believer should approach the common ground issue. What kind of strategy should they put forth? Well, I would hope that they would uh, maybe still retain an open mind, that they wouldn't go to the media stereotypes to immediately go, oh, uh, backwoods, southern, um, you know, ignorant, judgmental. Certainly, we've done plenty to, you know, reinforce that. But so is the television industry. So is the news industry. Um, I'd ask him to go a little bit deeper to drill down a little further and consider um, kind of the heart that that lies behind these pronouncements. If uh, Christians appear fearful, well, what is it that they're actually afraid of? Uh, Why do they they feel threatened by the gay movement? Why do they feel threatened by uh, certain politicians or certain changes on school boards? And, you know, try try to get at the fears. I mean, if anything, the Purple State of Mind proved is that to just respond on a surface level to the things that people are throwing out first and foremost is to miss it entirely. There's layers and layers of uh, reasons for why people make the choices they do, whether those are choices of faith or or fear. And so um, I guess I would ask those who uh, claim to be tolerant to practice a little more of it uh, when it comes to this particular subculture, which at this point is the subculture you're allowed to be the most intolerant of. Part of the problem here is, is that none of, you know, 
all of this is being defined by uh, particular issues. So abortion and gay marriage, okay, when it comes to abortion, one side in this argument sees it as murder, and the other side sees it as freedom. And those two arguments define everything else or have in the past. So, um, you know, part of the thing about abortion is that if the people who are murdering babies um, are that callous about that, you know, what else do we know about them? You know, the, the, not, the secular world is very often called a culture of death. Well, from the secular side, you hear that and you think, hmm, well, what will people do to people who they consider to be co- to, to be considered part of a culture of death? You know, how low and in, in what low regard must they hold them if that's, the, as the, if that's how, what they say about them? They're involved in a culture of death, and it's not just the abortion, it's the whole thing. And on the other side, you know, if you say, well, you know, these people, they, they won't even let me have control of my body. They won't even let me be married to my partner, my, my, my gay partner. You know, what else might they take away from me? And everything is extrapolated from these incredibly pressurized arguments that have not, not no argument that I've seen has managed to advance the ball on either side in a very long time. So if that's your starting point, you're dead mm. in terms of reaching out to the other side. You almost have to start someplace else. You have to find some other point of reference to get to the other side, and you have to come last to those things. And, and don't you think, John, we also have to admit that uh, the groups that have proffered these extremes have, have, have profited from them? Yeah. You know, there's a reason why they've reduced it to a couple issues, because it's really good for fundraising. So yeah. Purple State of Mind is predicated on the fact that most people are tired of this pointless argument, tired of the grandstanding, tired of the polarization, and are desperate to figure out, yeah, what do we have in common with the people who, who, you know, are in school with us, who live on our street, who I work with? We're much more than those two issues. Yeah, and in fact, you may find you have, and the other thing is that those same people who are profiting from this, they lose big time when the people, the public starts waking up to this. The public <laughs> starts saying, you know what, I actually like my neighbor. I totally disagree with them on that one issue, and I, you know, we're going to have to deal with that, but I really like them, and I'd actually like to make them a part of my lives. The minute that that begins to take off as a civic principle, the people who have thrived on the polarization, they're, 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 they're marginalized. So it's, it's, sur- it's money, it's survival, it's power for the people who stoke these arguments. And mm-hmm. they, will, they, they will do anything to protect those that, that division because it is their, it's their life and their livelihood, and it's really their reason for being in the public square at all. And so that's one of the things I think, you know, those of us who would like to see different discussion have to cop to is that um, there are strong vested interests there to make sure that people don't say, you know what, I'm just going to call that person. I'm just going to talk to them. I'm just going to try to see them a little differently. I'm not going to give up my own principle, but, you know, I'm going to try to, to, I'm just going to try to reframe this whole thing and understand them as a human being. Well, we're here talking with Craig Detweiler and John Marks about their documentary, Purple State of Mind, and how to find common ground in a divided culture. Uh, When we come back, we'll discuss this issue a little bit more in depth about uh, finding common ground on the issues that seem to be the two biggest for Christians on uh, abortion and homosexuality. We'll be right back after this. Halos and Avatars, Craig Detweiler's collection of up-to-the-minute essays on religious themes and video games. From a feminist reading of the Left Behind video game to an examination of bioethics and theology in controversial games such as Bioshock. This exciting new book dares to explore the connection between the games we play and the God we worship. Pick up your copy of Halos and Avatars today at the Ceasefire Strategies store. That's ceasefirestrategies.net slash store and receive free shipping on most orders over $25. Ceasefire Strategies is not affiliated with or endorsed by Halos and Avatars or its publisher, Westminster John Knox Press. Are you just watching? Do you enjoy watching movies? The cool effects, the interesting characters, the explosions. Yeah, you like the explosions, admit it. Well, we do too. But sometimes it pays to approach Hollywood media with a healthy dose of critical thinking. Join me, Daniel Lewis. And Eve Franklin. As we discuss our favorite movies. And share critical thinking for the entertained Christian. So visit AreYouJustWatching.com to subscribe. And don't just watch. Welcome back to Cultural Diplomacy. We're here with Craig Detweiler and John Marks discussing their documentary, Purple State of Mind. And uh, before we went to break, we had just briefly gotten into the issue of homosexuality and finding common ground within this issue. John was summarizing and recapping that in order for Christians to kind of get through to that other side, that starting from the point, this is a sin, we condemn you as a person, as a human being, that seems to be, a, or that that would be a strategy that really won't get through 
through the clutter that that would almost kind of be the final point to come to and that we really have to start at it from another point. Uh, does that seem like a fair summation of what you were uh, saying yeah. before? Okay. Yeah, you can't start with the issue. Okay. Well, uh, let me give it, Craig a chance to respond to that then uh, in uh, explaining kind of where he would come at from this position or on this issue. Well, I, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with thinking that think of, about things in a very foundationalist kind of way. Like, you hear these kind of arguments of slippery slopes is, is a word that Christians will often use. They'll, they'll suggest that, well, if we allow gay marriage, then pretty soon people will be allowed to, you know, marry their goat. <laughs> it's be allowed. And, and it, it's that massive leap that is predicated on a fear of the future. I understand maybe where it comes from. But, you know, I'm living in a situation in California, a very postmodern world, and everybody seems OK at our elementary school. Whether someone might have uh, two dads, two moms, it really doesn't affect what goes on in the classroom. It doesn't really affect my six year old or nine year old's ability to um, think, to reason, to laugh or to love. And so um, I, I think we have to get beyond this kind of uh, worst case scenario uh, fear driven stuff that everything is the last line, the last straw the the, the last battle upon which uh, the entire culture is going to crumble. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's fear driven and it's mm-hmm. full. Okay. Well let me ask Tim then, uh, coming from the religious background that you have where would you want to come in at this discussion? I think that we as Christians are uh, we're called to draw a line uh, and call sin sin, but I think that at the point we we judge somebody based on their sexual orientation or their proclivity to sin in a certain way, uh, and, and we view that person as just a homosexual sinner or just a murderer or whatever you know sin they committed, because all sin is sin, uh, I think that that's where we really lose our voice and we lose our audience. You know, we... we stand there and we want to label somebody by what actions they've done instead of labeling them by the fact that they're a person. And the homosexual is still a person and they still deserve to be treated with love and dignity and respect. Um, But at the same time, we do have an obligation to call sin, sin. And I think that it's a very sticky issue, but it's like uh, John said, you know, coming at it from the standpoint that you're a sinner and you're going to hell isn't going to get them to, you know, isn't going to get anybody, no matter what the the, the stance is, it's not going to get them to listen. I think we also just have to recognize that there's just, you know, there's history here that is far darker and bloodier than anything that we see in our own time. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you got to realize that every homosexual on the planet who knows anything about the history of their subculture understands that the life got really great for gay people when the church started to d- decline in Europe. Point mm-hmm. in the story. Church's decline, decline of Christianity after World War II in Europe was a moment of liberation for gay people in Europe. Um, you know, the last time that the church, Christianity, was really powerful throughout Europe was in the first half of the 20th century, the awful half, the half when the continent blew itself to pieces. You know, life got a lot better for Jewish people when the power of the church began to decline, when the power of Christianity began to decline. There's history back there, and, and what was going on for gay people and Jewish people before the power of the church declined was really, really bad. It wasn't just, oh, don't hurt my sensitive feelings. I know it was murder and rape, torture, and god-awful stuff, all committed in the name of Christianity. And that's not to say, oh, Christianity is the most awful thing in the world, but if you want to understand why there are so many people who have that feeling, who feel that so strongly, you know, every Christian in the world should know a, 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 an account of those history and know where that comes from, because without that history, you cannot understand any of this. Well, I want to read something from um, Craig's blog with your website. It's Purple State of Mind. This comes from the July 29th, 2008 post, Bitter in Tennessee, an Unholy Warrior. And, I mean, I guess the real issue is whether or not this is common or typical or if this is really just the outer fringe of people that do this sort of thing. But let me set this up real quick by reading from your blog. This is about the uh, shooter at Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church who went in and shot up the congregation. Why did he 
he single out Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalists. Evidently, the church has recently or had recently posted a sign welcoming gays into their congregation. It set off a firestorm on conservative and Christian talk radio in East Tennessee. And uh, then Craig links to a uh, article that he had found online, real quick paragraph. The specific chain of events that brought Jim Adkinson to the TVUC sanctuary was a recent decision to erect a sign specifically welcoming LGBT people into the congregation. That choice evidently set off a firestorm in the local right-wing community with the specific church and its location named repeatedly on right-wing and evangelical radio. The gunman, already looking for someone to take out his rage on, evidently took the path of local least resistance. At any rate, while I'm not sure it's even worth assigning blame, it's not likely that Jim Atkinson would have driven the 10 miles from his ex-urban hovel to my family's church if he hadn't learned what he needed about where to go on the radio. I guess, Craig, I wanted to ask you, is this something that's pretty typical and common for people reacting in these red state, blue state ways, or is this just sort of something on the outer fringe and we can just look at these people as, oh, they're crazy? <laughs> you know, I think, I, no, I think John Marks and I made the Purple State of Mind project because we, we, we find, um, you know, warning signs. Uh, these kind of things crop up, you know, with kind of the angry white male. Uh, they crop up on a regular basis. And and um, whether it's a school shooting or a church shooting, uh, at what point do we kind of lose a grip on society? And the culture war becomes much more than, than a shouting match, and it becomes a shooting match. We've seen instances of it. And so Purple State of Mind is, is both a cautionary tale and a, a plea for, uh, you know, civility. Is that right, John? It basically comes down to this. The world and this country have got to be big enough to hold all of us. Nobody is going, though all those millions of Christians are not going to renounce their faith. They're not going anywhere. They're not going to immigrate. Uh, all those secular people, they're staying too. So either you find a way to live together, to see each other as human beings, to forge your compromises, and everyone has to compromise, and everyone has to sacrifice, and everybody has to see if they insist on seeing all compromise as an impugning of their dignity, then they have to live with that. That is the way this works. Um, if we can't do that, if that breaks down, then we have a real problem because our country is not based upon an ethnic homogeneity. It is a heterog heterogeneous society by definition, which means that all of our major cities are have all different kinds of people in them, and, you know, it can't work. So, yeah, I think Purple State of Mind is a very modest attempt to say um, we cannot go any further in this direction. It is bad for us. The alternative is to listen and proceed, you know, as if the other side is a human, our human being. And, and uh, what was it, Martin Luther King, who said we shall either, uh, you know, learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we shall perish as fools. And uh, I think John and I were willing to make ourselves look <laughs> foolish on camera for the uh, sake of hopefully, you know, helping folks figure out how to live together. Well, I know that in another promotional uh, bit of material, John had expressed, well, actually even in the film itself, that uh, you were sort of concerned with where the Democratic Party was headed in its worldview, not really sure if it even had one. But you were also a bit concerned for how people preach tolerance and wanting tolerance, but yet at the same time being somewhat intolerant at wanting to eradicate religion. Could you kind of explain a little bit more about where you're coming from on that? Well, the Republican Party actually solved that problem. <laughs> I don't think that's true anymore. I think that the Democratic Party for decades had splintered into a lot of different smaller interest groups. I think one of the reasons why the last eight years were so bad and, and, and had to do with the fact that the opposition was splintered into small parties who found it very hard to come up with a common set of ideals, a set of universal lines that the other side shouldn't have been allowed to cross. There was too little thinking about universal, the largest things, what binds us all together. You hear Obama talk, he's talking universals. He has no patience for identity politics. He's not interested. It's not who he is, and he is forcing the Democratic Party, and this is wonderful in my opinion, it is much needed medicine, and it's very hard for some to take. You know, it's, it was very clear to everybody what, what a difficult time Jesse Jackson was having with Barack Obama during the election because 
Jesse Jackson's entire career was built upon identity politics. And there, there are people in every subgroup, and the evangelical Christians are no different, who have built up their entire public narratives on victimization and empowerment for one group. And we have come to a moment when that's all I can say is basically that Obama represents the change. He has a center. It's a universal. He is someone who is interested in a, a universal principle of governance and of civil society. And that is what the Democratic Party laughed, lacked. Well, the reason I had brought up that question was to kind of uh, move into the next issue of abortion. I know the Democrats weren't nearly as divided as pro-choice as uh, Republicans have been on varying degrees of pro-life. But um, the reason I had asked that question was that there are some degrees of pro-choice in the Democratic Party. And I wanted to sway towards the abortion issue next. But we do have to take a break real quick. Uh, we're talking with Craig Detweiler and John Marks for their documentary, Purple State of Mind. Welcome to Daily Reflections for Movie Lovers. From Hollywood to the hearts, finding nuggets of truth from the movies. Are you destined to find your one true love? English woman Sarah is willing to leave romance to fate in the 2002 movie Serendipity. She meets John while shopping in New York. John writes his contact information on a $5 bill and gives it to her to spend. Likewise, she picks out a used book and writes her information on the inside cover. Years pass, and these signs serendipitously come back into their lives. Many young people today are in love with love, yet chance can be very cruel. There is a greater love than serendipitously finding that certain someone. You can trust in God, who is always there, ready to extend His perfect love to you, always. His love is greater than any you'll find on this planet. For more information, go to imamovielover.com. That's imamovielover.com. Are you sleeping? Yeah, why? What, do you think I'm hallucinating again? They just look like what you used to draw when you weren't sleeping. Henry has a sleep disorder, which causes him to hallucinate. But when he runs into an old friend and discovers that she's being stalked, he begins to believe that his hallucinations may be glimpses of her future. I have no idea who it is. I just started getting pictures in the mail. He'd write poems on the back of each picture. Emily, get inside! You lied to me. You have been hallucinating. I'm sorry, but there's something to this. I've been given a glimpse of something terrible. And what are you supposed to do about it? I'm supposed to stop it! Cold October, a Michael J. Whistler short film, now available on DVD and video on demand through IndieFlix.com. For more information, check out ColdOctoberFilm.Webs.com. Welcome back to Cultural Diplomacy. We're here with Craig Detweiler and John Marks discussing their film Purple State of Mind, Finding Common Ground in a Divided Culture. And before the break, we were discussing uh, the issue of homosexuality, and uh, I had brought up the issue of the Democrats having a uniformed worldview, especially in relation to degrees of uh, stances on the pro-choice issue. And before we get into that as well, I wanted to interject something you had stated before the break, John, about Obama speak from the point of kind of universals and uh, no longer that identity politics. This is an issue I really wanted to grapple with the moment I saw that it had become a controversy and I do see po both sides of it. But when Obama chose Pastor Rick Warren to open up the inauguration with prayer, uh, there was all of this heat and fire going back and forth between the gay community and the Obama administration. So I wanted to kind of ask your perspective on what do you think that the, what was really the core of that controversy? Why was it, at least in the sense of identity politics, if Christians need to sort of back off of that identity politics, what was it that brought the gays and lesbians forward in that identity politics that was so much more important than Christians having an identity in politics? Well, I think it came really down to the Proposition 8 ban on gay marriage in California. I think it's Prop 8. The um, fact that Rick Warren, of all things, was a California pastor who had fought in that battle against, you know, for, for, for Prop 8 and therefore against their right to marry in California. Now, that to them was the whole, that was, that was everything. 
the fact that they had waited for eight years, eight years of a hostile administration who made no bones about their disdain for gay and lesbian issues, suddenly have their guy for whom many of them had stumped and fought, uh, many from whom many had given up, you know, their devotion to Hillary Clinton to change sides and to support for him to then pick this pastor of all pastors, I mean, you know, some of them went so far to say, couldn't they have picked a pastor from Oklahoma, Georgia, anyone, anybody but this guy? And what they didn't understand or see, and this is why I applauded the choice and uh, and still do, is that, yes, that is true of Rick Warren, and it is and it is a painful choice for that reason. But the flip side is that Rick Warren, within his own community, represents a moderate voice, and I actually think a voice that is slowly moving Christians towards a more accepting and even a compromise, kind of, and this is not a dirty word for me, you know, towards a greater sense of compromise when it comes to these issues. But neither side, I mean, I think I know there are people who are on the Christian side who find Rick Warren to be, you know, um, too toying too much with emerging poly, uh, emerging church stuff and, and uh, you know, is too much of a moderate. They objected to him as well. But a painful choice needed to be made so that the president could say, look, it is a new day and we are going to change this dialogue. And we're this the choice of Rick Warren was a symbolic one, but it was a symbolic one meant to launch a new conversation. And to me, that had a greater value than the immediate pain caused by the choice of gay people. Although, of course, I'm not gay, so I didn't have to feel that pain. Along those lines, uh, you know, with the failure of a lot of these gay marriage uh, initiatives in some of these states, and we'll get back to abortion later. I guess my thinking is when you look at the numbers and the percentages by which these measures are being voted against, there can't possibly be, it's not necessarily 52% or whatever Christians voting against this. This is involving people who are secular or who would not consider themselves to be of an evangelical or uh, Christian mindset. Why do you think that the gay community lashes out against the Christian anti uh, or the Christian support of these amendments and initi- in initiatives as opposed to all of the people who vote against it? Yeah, well, specifically like with Prop Eight, that they were making it seem as if every single person who voted, and I'm trying to remember how the pro-con went on the language of that bill, but those who were in favor of the ban on gay marriage, they sort of made it or portrayed it as if everyone who voted that way was religious in some way, and not everyone who voted that way was religious. No, that's a huge dirty secret about this whole issue, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of women, period, who don't want, want to see gay marriage uh, institutionalized because they feel uh, that it, it's a it's a kind of threat to it's a kind of threat at some level there, regardless of what religious persuasion one has. I think that's right. I think it's here's the reason why I think that all the heat falls on the Christian community. It is an open question whether the movement to uphold uh, traditional marriage and the ban gay marriage would have the money or the force or the momentum without that Christian drive, that fee, that that theological mm-hmm. position and the, and the organization that you get through the churches that that always manages to find a way to organize. These other people who are opposed to it and go out and vote against it, they enjoy that privilege, the right to vote against it, I think in large part because churches and church-based movements organize the opposition to gay marriage. Mm-hmm. They're, they hop on board, but then they hide in the weeds. You know, it's rare mm-hmm. to have somebody come out and say on television, listen, I'm not religious and I'm totally against this. They, because the, because they don't even have a theological, they just don't want it, you know, if mm-hmm. it's either for Christian or whatever. So, but it is unfair to Christians in, in that regard because they're not the only ones who are involved. I just think the reality is that I, 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 I have not seen secular organizations that have the same uh, energy when it mm-hmm. comes to staying on point on this issue year after year after year after year. So the gays and lesbians basically say, look, yeah, we have these fellow travelers here, but look, here is the enemy. Here are the mm-hmm. people who raise the money and fight the battle day and day out and who we see on the school boards raising it, you know, et, et cetera, as an issue with terms of books in the library. That's why I think that perception exists. But I do take mm-hmm. the point that it's not, it's not entirely fair. Yeah, I, I guess I, the way I look at it is I see that there are a lot of people out there who may be more upset that there are these activist judges out there just sort Sort of saying, oh, it must be legal because there's no constitutional definition, uh, and 
And there are a lot of people out there who find that offensive, right. more so than gay marriage or abortion or anything that these judges have deemed legal. It's more of the whole separation of powers and who has you know, the right to determine law, the people or the judges. And I think that that's where a lot of people also may fall into uh, disagreement on issues. Well, I agree. I think one of the big things that we could discuss in this country that is very hard to get at when it, when it only feels like it's an abstraction, but if there could be a way to start talking about where we find our authority for this government. Because mm-hmm. everybody invokes the Constitution or they invoke elements in the Constitution, but at some point, you know, there's an unspoken notion about what is what is what is our authority here? Is it a, and is it do we on both sides do we feel that there is a moral authority? And often enough, there is. You know, the people who feel that their rights have been infringed, whether gays or women or African Americans or whoever, they're invoking a moral authority that they feel must be enshrined in the Constitution. It must be there. There and there is language to to kind of cling to or to respond to in the Constitution to give them that interpretation. On the other hand, you know, for those who feel that the authority is really vested in the Constitution itself into the laws as more strictly interpreted or it is invested in some divine principle that undergirds those laws, they also can find in the Constitution and in and in and in, 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 in American history certainly, you know, arguments for that. But we don't we you know this idea of going back to first principles and say, let's at least get on the table where our different sources of authority are coming from because until you cop to that, you know, it's part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people aren't gonna say, look, I'm not I'm not drawing I don't draw my sense of the authority to make change here, to to rethink these basic issues from the same place you do. So if you know, and that's a, that's a deep problem, mm-hmm. and I think it cuts right through every single issue here. What is it that you hold to be the deepest possible principle principles? Because those principles principles of people, the ones that people fight and die for, and um, if they're not the same, it's a problem. And the first way to address that problem is to at least acknowledge it and get it out on the table and allow people to talk about that. Uh, as opposed to gay marriage, abortion, even the judge's issue. The judge's issue is definitely you know, a question of authority. Well, these are these are definitely such uh, tough and complicated issues, and we certainly, none of us here, I would hope, would be uh, making the claim that uh, we're the final authority or that we have all these issues wrapped up, especially within you know, one hour. But on that regard, we do have about six minutes left, and I do want to kind of go around the metaphorical room here and at least just touch on the issue of abortion, what one or two things do y- either of you believe we could do to, or what kind of common ground could we find among this issue? You know what I, I find most fascinating about uh, this issue is how science will is, is pushing it in ways that, that have, are forcing redefinition. So as an example, um, you know, as, as pictures of um, fetuses in a womb become more uh, available to pregnant moms. You see this moment in a film like Juno, where she realizes what the baby looks like, or where she mm-hmm. hears the baby's heartbeat. And so science, in a sense, is pushing on the idea that life begins earlier and earlier. In fact, science is allowing life to continue from an earlier and earlier stage. Where we haven't been before, where, where, where it gets kind of weird and strange, is um, a situation where you have a mom who's had, you know, six kids. She has another eight kids. She has octuplets. Now, how pro-life are you? Are you pro-life <laughs> up to 14 kids on your own with no husband? Are you that pro-life? Uh-huh. And and I think it's going to cause a different kind of conversation, which I think is, is quite uh, well. Well, don't you think also that the pro-life uh, side of things tends to use pictures of babies that are much older but say oh this is a newborn baby or this is you know a baby at nine weeks when it's really at like 14 weeks or 16 weeks does that make a difference honestly because i know some pro-choice uh, friends of mine look at that and they see it more as the deceptive nature but they do make some cases that when you're talking about a nine week year old baby and you're showing a picture of a 14 week year old fetus or baby or whatever um or what you know whatever you're calling it that there is big enough of a difference that what you're saying these legal issues are at nine weeks are really irrelevant at 14. Do we really want to break it down that far? Is that a deceptive tactic of the pro-life movement? I mean, you talked about science pushing it forward in that regard, but isn't some of that mildly deceptive as well? Well, I'm I'm talking about I'm talking about getting beyond the uh, the politics and the pol- parties and interest groups that are, are again are, are driving this discussion. I'm not talking about people trying to raise money and 
using images for or against. I'm talking about the average person who's making life decisions has more um, knowledge available to them than they have before and more possibilities to play the role of God than previously before. And so the ethical lines, I think, are going to start to be redrawn. And we haven't even begun to realize kind of the, the depths of where issues of cloning, of humanity, what is a soul, all those kinds of things are going to come back, things that have been kind of left off the table for a long time. The soulfulness of humanity is going to come back with this question of cloning. And I don't think anybody's quite ready to deal with that. Why don't you go ahead and share with us the website for your film and how people can check out a way to see a copy of the film. Well, sure. You, we blog um, almost every day at uh, purplestateofmind.com. And the film is actually uh, going to be available widely on Netflix, Blockbuster, Amazon.com. Uh, so you can get it really at almost any outlet in the days to come. And uh, the website, purplestateofmind.com, is a place where you can buy the DVD as well. There's also You can also buy Craig's book, or you have links to buy my book, Reasons to Believe. Uh, it is, uh, it's a clearinghouse for all the questions that are raised by the movie. There are also YouTube. Anybody who wants to just check out a little bit of the movie, maybe look at the trailer, or a couple of conversations, all that stuff, you can find at YouTube. Just go to YouTube and type in Purple State of Mind. Um, also, the paperback, the book is Reasons to Believe. It's called Reasons to Believe, One Man's Journey Among the Evangelicals and the Faith He Left Behind. And there's actually a new afterword at the end of the paperback, which comes out tomorrow or comes out February 24th, which um, which I write about Purple State of Mind and the experience of traveling across the country and talking to different audiences about this dialogue question. Now, will that new afterword be implanted into the hardback later, or will it just this just be exclusive to the paperback? It's only in the paperback only for the payback. Certainly appreciate that you've been here and uh, thank you so much and uh, we'll catch our listeners right back here uh, next time on Cultural Diplomacy. Cultural Diplomacy is a production of Ceasefire Strategies, a ministry seeking to bridge the gap between Christians and culture. Visit us online at www.ceasefirestrategies.com To discuss the show or learn more about today's guest, check out the CFS forums at www.ceasefirestrategies.net Acta Ace Fabula Padite